Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. And I would like to welcome you to webinar number two of our Pulma Vista webinar, Pulma Vista 500 webinar series. My name is Margarita Singer, and I am the regional marketing manager for intensive care in Dragon Middle East and Africa. So today I am very excited because we have a guest speaker who uh, have a very diverse knowledge and experience uh, with electrical lipid tomography and the clinical application of the Pulmodista 500 um, in the hospital settings. Today is our second webinar of the series. And in the first webinar, we address the clinical advantages of the regional ventilation distribution monitoring. So basically, I've introduced the concept of electrical impedance tomography, and we also have done the hands-on on the basic application of the um, full Modista 500. And today, we are going to be talking about a more advanced topic, so image guide plan protection, and how full Modista 500 can support you in your clinical um, therapy including recruitment maneuvers. And I'm extremely, extremely excited to welcome today our guest speaker, Mr. Edward Techman, who, uh, as I mentioned, whose experience is so diverse and so in-depth, and I'm quite happy to have him today to cover this topic. Edward has an engineering background, but he has also experience in the emergency clinical settings and in the intensive care environment. He has been part of more than 80 uh, clinical, preclinical, and uh, uh, educational research papers and publications. He's been working with the key opinion leaders in the field of intensive care together, uh, supporting their research when it comes to the electrical impedance tomography. So, as I mentioned today, we're going to be talking about the image guide plan protection, and I would like to welcome Eckert to be our presenter. So, Eckert, the stage is yours, and thank you for being here with us today. All right. Thank you very much for the introduction, Margarita. Uh, it's a big pleasure for me to be here. Uh, to talk uh, with you about uh, ERT and the clinical applications. And uh, yeah, I'd like to start right now. Um, so I guess you all can see the screen uh, properly. And let's see if I get the thing started here. Yeah, the subject of today is uh, image guided lung protection and uh, also assessment of recruitment maneuvers with uh, electrical impedance tomography. And uh, Margarita already did the brief introduction. So just a little bit more about uh, my person. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm involved in ERT research since more than 20 years already. And uh, I've uh, yeah, started with the basic research at a time where electrical impedance tomography was not really accessible uh, in the clinical routine. And since 10 years now, we have a commercial device on the market. And of course, now the experience also in the clinical application of uh, electrical impedance tomography is rapidly growing. So here in Germany, for example, the, the major university hospitals uh, already have and already use uh, uh, electrical impedance tomography, not only for the clinical research, but also for daily practice. And uh, because I'm involved in so many studies, I also got access to very many clinical data from studies. And that is exactly the material that I will also use today to give you a more illustrative uh, introduction how this, these images created by ERT, uh, how image-guided lung protection can be quite easily applied uh, in clinical routine. So let's get it started. 
The first one, uh, the role of ERT in respiratory therapy and lung protection. Uh, I think Margareta already mentioned in the first webinar that uh, as a starting point, when we're doing an introduction on the clinical benefits on ERT, we typically start with a very easy slide about the general goals for respiratory therapy. And I'm sure you all know about that probably much better than I do. But it's all about, I mean, when we are ventilating a patient, it's all about achieving and maintaining an acceptable gas exchange. But at the same time, there's more and more evidence about the fact that uh, we have to make sure that uh, we are doing it in a lung protective way, which means we have to minimize adverse effects uh, like ventilator associated lung injury and inflammatory uh, inflammation. Uh, when we, or while we are trying to achieve the best gas exchange for our patients. We also have need to control the mechanical power of the lung tissue. And uh, so, because if we don't do that, the lung tissue is uh, damaged and then, uh, you know, the inflammatory markers are released into the body. And uh, it's not just about the structural damage of the lung tissue, but we all know that uh, uh, inflammatory responses can finally lead to multi-organ failure. So when we talk about uh, these kind of effects, um, and this is just a CT scan, uh, with a, which is uh, done in a rather schematic way to illustrate uh, what I'm trying to talk about right now. Um, if you take a look in a, of a CT scan in a, in a mechanically ventilated patient, uh, typically the ventral parts are uh, at risk to be over the standard. It's always in a, in a supine positioned patient, it always happens in the ventral parts of the lung uh, because uh, there the impact of the gravity is not present. So overs distension is a regional effect which can be controlled with and monitored with regional information as it is provided by ERT. Then typically there's a region of the lung that is still ventilated, more or less, and depending on the size, uh, you know, Luciano Gattinoni once uh, defined it as a baby lung, if just maybe 20, 30, 40% of the lung still can contribute to a sufficient gas exchange. And this is also taking then the, the mechanical power, of course. And then we have in the, typically in the dorsal part, uh, lung regions that are either collapsed or they might also be uh, uh, minimized due to the presence of uh, pleural fusion. And we uh, have also a, a part of the lung that is typically very much at risk, which is a transition zone between collapsed lung tissue and normally aerated or ventilated lung tissue. And that is this yellow region, uh, where cyclic opening and closing, also known as tidal recruitment, are present. And so the, these effects, they can only be visualized with electrical impedance tomography because a CT scan is just taking a snapshot. So we are not able to use a CT scan to visualize a dynamic process such as cycling opening and closing. You need a basically dynamic information to visualize these kind of effects. Why is it so important to, to take uh, care that the, the patient's lungs are homogeneously ventilated? Well, that is uh, nicely illustrated by a study also from uh, a number of very famous researchers, including uh, Luciano Gattinoni again. And he has uh, calculated the mechanical stress on the lung tissue. And if he has done it uh, in a healthy lung with uh, no inhomogeneities, uh, he found that the regional stress on the lung tissue was very low. And that was indicated by the blue color. However, in contrast, uh, in a patient with severe ARDS, there are very many transition zones between consolidated lung tissue and open lung tissue. And in those transition zones, as I also pointed it out with the cycling opening and closing, in those regions, there is a stress that is uh, much, much higher as compared to the homogeneous lung. And he also demonstrated that uh, 
lung inhomogeneities are also associated with uh, disease, disease severity and also mortality. So in our patients, even though maybe, maybe the gas exchange is nicely controlled because we have set the FIR2 values uh, on a high number, uh, we still put the patients at risk if we do not take care of those lung inhomogeneities, trying to minimize them. Okay, uh, because of uh, all those conditions that I've just uh, demonstrated you based on a CT scan, we tried uh, uh, recently to develop a, a view uh, which is utilizing information based on electrical impedance tomography to visualize all those effects that are putting the patient's lung at risk. And this uh, view in our device is called the diagnostic view. And I would uh, like to quickly guide you through the concept of this view. So first of all, in the upper part, we basically display, um, and I uh, will put on my pointer now right here so that I can better demonstrate. So in the very upper part, we see basically the impedance waveforms. And we have studies uh, where it was proven that the impedance waveform that basically can be taken as volume waveforms. So the correlation between a volume waveform and an impedance, impedance waveform is uh, extremely high. Except uh, on a waiter, ventilator, you typically do not see those offsets. Those offsets and the ERT waveforms are based uh, on the fact that uh, during a PEEP trial uh, with a higher PEEP, there is an increase of end expiratory lung volume, and that can also be displayed in those curves. But if you would uh, take uh, impedance waveform as a during a steady state ventilation, then the volume waveform and the impedance waveform would look exactly the same. In this uh, view, we are only using those uh, waveforms to define analysis point, for example, uh, to uh, identify uh, sections uh, with a, during the decremented PEEP trial where each of those uh, marked analysis points would represent one uh, PEEP level. So in this example, we start, for example, at the peak level of 14, going down in steps of two, down to a peak level of six. And so, just a second. And then for each of those uh, peak uh, steps, we are then displaying those uh, tidal images. And I, I believe, uh, uh, Margarita has already explained in the first webinar what such a tidal image stands for. It's basically uh, representing the regional distribution of the tidal volumes which each uh, breath. And then we basically can already see when we follow those tidal images, we can already see that in this particular patient uh, at a peak level uh, being below 10 centimeters of water, we start already to see a dorsal collapse in the lung, in the lung regions. Okay, then uh, below that, and that is probably uh, new for you, we can also display maps of uh, regional loss of compliance. And I will explain those concepts uh, on the next slides. However, you can say if, if there is a decrease of compliance uh, towards higher peak levels, like in this example, it is inter interpreted as uh, over distension. In contrast, if the compliance decreases uh, down to the lower peak levels, and that typically happens in the dorsal parts, we can assume that is uh, due to de-recruitment or uh, dorsal collapse. And then, in, like in this example, we always will be able to plot those uh, uh, developments towards higher peak levels or towards lower peak levels. And what we always see in those kind of peak trials, and I've uh, analyzed more than 150, 150 different uh, peak maneuvers uh, with the ERT recordings, we always see these kind of opposing trend where uh, the over distension as expected, increases towards higher peak levels and the dorsal de-recruitment uh, 
also increases towards lower peak levels. And if you compare these two lines, we see this opposing trend and always with a clear, clearly defined cross-section point, which can in a way be interpreted, interpreted as uh, the best compromise between hyperinflation and collapse. So that is a diagram. So basically, this is a view that if it's opened and assessed during a PEEP trial, we can simultaneously display regions uh, that are over the standard, regions that are collapsed, and also, and I haven't talked about that one, in yellow marked in the title images, we can also assess cycling opening and closing. And that is something, this, uh, this piece of information is based on uh, publications that have been made uh, in the past years. And we have scanned all the different uh, publications of parameters in order to identify uh, the parameters that are mostly suitable for showing these kind of effects. So how is overdistension and collapse uh, displayed? I will just quickly uh, give you an example of that. So that is a publication that we refer to. It's from the group of uh, Marcelo Armato in Brazil. And so um, he has already described in 2009 that if you take a ERT image, take a look at the different pixels, one in the non-dependent part, one in the dependent part, we always, and then you plot the compliance for different PEEP levels, you will always be able to determine a PEEP level where the pixel compliance shows the highest compliance. compliance. However, depending on where the pixel in the lung is located, the, the highest compliance, for example, in the non-dependent part will be uh, at a relatively low PEEP, while the compliance in the dependent part because the effect of gravity uh, requires a higher peep level in those dependent pixels, is uh, located at a different point. And then if you basically take such an image and then you have, let's say, 10 different peep levels, where, which you have done uh, during a decremented peep trial, and basically you could assume, well, the highest pixel compliance uh, is located at a given uh, peep level. And if the compliance goes down towards lower peep levels, this is then interpreted as a, a resulting of a dorsal collapse. However, if uh, the compliance goes down towards higher peep levels, then it only can be caused by uh, hyperinflation. So basically we can say we are comparing the best compliance in any pixel at any peep level and we are uh, doing a clinical interpretation of the compliance drop in a certain pixel. I should uh, mention that this approach can only be used during a diagnostic peep trial and I will also show you some examples on how this information can be utilized. The second parameter that we're using is a diagnostic view. In the diagnostic view is a so-called regional ventilation delay. And that was uh, based on a publication from 2012, where it has been demonstrated that this parameter, where the cause of the global impedance waveform is also compared to pixel waveforms, but it's rather uh, utilizing the dynamic information that is provided by ERT. And you can say if a pixel waveform shows a substantial delay as compared to the global signal, the average signal, then it can be assumed that it's, uh, this pixel is affected by late opening and early closing. And that is uh, what, uh, and it was also demonstrated against the CT scan data in an animal trial, that uh, this provides a good estimate of the amount of tidal recruitment in those lung regions. So these are the new para parameters that we are utilizing right now. And then of course, we can ask ourselves, well, um, why is it so relevant to have this information available when we uh, want to maintain lung protective ventilation? Uh, and uh, well, uh, I believe that uh, until 
three or four years ago, uh, there was still already, of course, a discussion on uh, do we have already uh, any kind of clinical evidence on the benefits of recruitment maneuvers and also on PEEP titration. And then uh, in that time, uh, we had the learnings from the R trial. That was a large study also performed by uh, some researchers in South America. And that tried to demonstrate that uh, using the um, low peep table of the ARDS network trial as a control, then they have done, okay, we, we define a recruitment maneuver, fairly aggressive recruitment maneuver, I could say, and then doing a subsequent peep trial. And then we would like to demonstrate that uh, if we do this kind of maneuvers in the study group, uh, the mortality would be lower. Unfortunately, or uh, to the disappointment of the researchers, they found that actually the low peep table of the ARD net network group resulted in a lower mortality. So there was a difference of 6% in mortality. And because it was a large trial with more than a thousand patients included, uh, the results were also statistically significant. So they failed to demonstrate that, um, yeah, a recruitment maneuver in ARDS patients and the subsequent PEEP trial uh, would have a positive effect on mortality. So that motivated already some uh, authors of an editorial to ask, is the door closing? on the open lung. And I believe all of you are knowing very well the open lung concept. I don't know whether or not you're using these kind of approaches, but in this study, um, it was demonstrated that uh, at least not for everybody, a recruitment maneuver, which is uh, really designed in a way that it opens up uh, the lung is uh, beneficial also for uh, in terms of mortality. So uh, the question I would like to ask and also to discuss at this point is uh, what could have an image-guided trial design have contributed so, to such a study? So first of all, sorry, I forgot to mention uh, in the study group, uh, the, this study didn't have to do anything with the ERT. So ERT was not used in the study. Uh, they have actually used um, as a best PEEP, the PEEP level with the best or highest respiratory system compliance. So that was a leading parameter. But uh, I'd like to demonstrate here and to illustrate that the best compliance doesn't automatically mean this is the open lung. So uh, of course, I'm not having access to the uh, data from the R trial and ERT was not used. But uh, I've been involved in a different study where we also had, uh, however, not ARDS patients, but post-operative cardiac surgery patients. They also have done a PEEP, PEEP trials with a, a initial but moderate recruitment maneuver. But remember, it was not ARDS patients, so uh, the lung was quite easy to open in those kind of patients. And uh, so it was not such an aggressive recruitment maneuver required. And uh, well, the principle was, very similar to what I just uh, presented. In initial recruitment maneuver, decremented PEEP trial, but in this example, just from 14 down to 6. And then after the best PEEP was determined, but that was again, like in the R trial, also determined uh, based on the highest uh, respiratory system compliance, then they have done a second recruitment maneuver to reopen the lung, and then they have set the best PEEP according to the highest respiratory system compliance. So if you look in this particular example, uh, where the highest compliance was, it was in the PEEP levels between 10 and 8. So especially in cardiac surgery patients, of course, uh, we would have selected the, as the best PEEP, the PEEP level of 8. And that was also actually was what, what was uh, defined here. So let's take the best PEEP of eight. But if you now would display the series of ERT images, you would see that at this best PEEP, based on the respiratory system compliance, at the best PEEP, the lung was already completely collapsed. And that is basically illustrated here in this gray zones, which mean in the gray zones, 
there was ventilation at higher peep levels, but at the given peep level of eight, there was no ventilation taking place. So a completely de-recruited lung at the peep level of eight, but remember that was the best peep according to the highest respiratory system compliance. So then of course we can ask ourselves, how can it be that even with a collapsed lung, the compliance is higher than uh, at uh, the fully opened lung. And uh, if we take a look on the differential images, uh, compliance changes, but now referred against the highest peep level, then we basically can explain and understand what uh, leads to a higher compliance, even though the lung is collapsed. So in this image series here, we are comparing the pixel compliance against the highest peep level. So that is a black image because it's a baseline here. Then we also can see at the peep level of 12, we don't see substantial changes in compliance. But now you see a pattern that is getting stronger and stronger, which means while we are losing dorsal compliance here, that is marked here now in the orange color, at the same time, we win blue areas and blue is a compliance win. So when we compare the parameters, we can see that 14 is already a higher win in the central part of the body as compared to the dorsal part. And here this win is even higher and that is the explanation why we see the highest compliance at the peep level of eight. But basically what it means is where the dorsal lung is completely collapsed, we have a higher compliance in the central region of the lung. However, remember the image with the homogeneity. Uh, of course, this setting for the lung is not so lung protective as compared to a peep level of 12. So um, that is also uh, again from the art file that's uh, written by the authors in a letter to the editor. Uh, what they stated was that the observed harm of the art strategy seemed to be concentrated in those patients with either null or negative recruitability. But they only had, uh, you know, the changes of the driving pressure to estimate uh, recruitability. But now with, uh, you know, regional information based on the ERT images, of course, we have much, much more uh, possibilities to monitor these uh, effects. And that is exactly what was stated here as something that is probably missing. The intensive monitoring of those patients uh, could have uh, possibly improved uh, the results or also the identification, which of those patients would possibly benefit from recruitment maneuvers, even aggressive recruitment maneuvers, and which is rather uh, part of this group where the harm was observed. So when we talk about uh, recruitability, uh, probably most of you know this uh, very frequently cited uh, study from Luciani Gattinoni again, where he uh, just compared uh, based on CT scans, uh, uh, lungs uh, on the pressure level of five against 45. And what he found and described in this uh, nice, very nice paper is, that uh, in some patients, the CT scan at a pressure of five looked exactly the same like at 45 centimeters of water, despite of this large difference in pressures. However, in other patients, uh, he noticed and observed large differences. So in those patients, he found a higher percentage of potentially recruitable lung. And he also stated that the percentage potentially recruitable lung is extremely variable and it's also strongly associated with that response to PEEP. So what we can already take from this statement on the vari variability is that airway pressure settings call for individual adjustment. So, uh, well, I'm not going into the details. You probably all know much better than I do, but I can tell you, and it's also based on my personal experience from the trials where I have involved, been involved in, is that, uh, yeah, the individual response of, to a specific recruitment maneuver strongly varies and depends on so many different conditions. And as I said, I'm not going into all the details, but uh, uh, 
I mean, based on the findings of the R trial, we can say, okay, it's probably too late. If you do an aggressive recruitment maneuver and you really do a harm to the patient, then it's uh, possibly not very beneficial to know afterwards if you have damaged the lung or not. Uh, I think we, we need a tool that can actually predict the recruitability before the aggressive recruitment maneuver is done. And I would now like to introduce to you how I believe this can nicely be done with uh, based on electrical impedance tomography, based on image-guided lung protection. So um, the, the little instruction that I present you right now is something that I will illustrate um, later on, just after this. And I can already tell you that uh, typically we can define three clusters of uh, response to this assessment of lung rec recruitability. And that is, uh, some patients are recruitable, Obviously, that is something Luciano Gattinoni already demonstrated. In some patients, we found a fully open lung. So there's no way to, to open the lung because the lung is already open. And the third group is a group where maybe the lung is not open, but also cannot be opened. For example, this is uh, typically the case when the patient has pleural fusion because you cannot simply uh, uh, decompress or squeeze the fluid out in the presence of pleural fusion uh, just by applying high pressures. You first would have to do a drainage. So these are the three clusters. Lung fully open, so no recruitment maneuver required. Lung may be collapsed, dorsal, no dorsal ventilation, but the lung cannot be opened or the lung can be recruited. So how to assess it with a ERT? Um, okay, so right here we have already the first example, image guided assessment. So in this patient, for example, we have just applied a, a moderate increase of PEEP and in other examples, uh, you, you wouldn't need uh, to increase the PEEP by 10 centimeters of water, like in this example, the clear signal would also already be given at a PEEP increase of five. So that is all it takes, a temporal increase of the PEEP, let's say by five centimeters of water. And if you would see this kind of pattern, there where, where the PEEP increment just results in a reduction of compliance, then you already know that uh, in this patient, a recruitment maneuver will not be beneficial. And the explanation for that is, uh, basically, the lung was already fully opened. So if you have these kind of patients at the bedside, then, and maybe uh, in this view, you know, we can uh, express a percentage of doors of ventilation if we subdivide such a tidal image into layers. And if you see that the dorsal layer has, let's say, 10% or 12%, something certainly about, well, about uh, 8%, then probably uh, this patient doesn't need a recruitment maneuver because there's nothing to recruit. The lung is fully open. Okay. So that is uh, the first pattern that we frequently see. Still, in this uh, example, the PEEP elevation was done, but that was definitely one of those patients where the doctors in future trials probably would say, no, uh, we don't do a recruitment maneuver at all. There's nothing to recruit. Next one. Well, in this patient, in this example, we see uh, in the tidal images, okay, there is uh, no dorsal ventilation in the left lung. You can see black area here, absence of ventilation. And that is something where, of course, uh, a doctor would uh, be motivated to uh, reopen the lung to make the ventilation distribution much more homogeneous. But if you then take a look, and in this example, the PEEP was only elevated by four, but basically we, we do not see a substantial effect uh, you basically see that 
the doors along and that was was the only part that could be recruited because the right lung was fully opened but the doors along the ventilation did not change did not improve and so that means uh, it's also a non-responder to a recruitment maneuver but for a different reason so what was the reason here? And that is just uh, in this uh, patient, you also see that uh, the uh, inspiratory course in some Marango regions was uh, very inhomogeneous. So that is just another thing we could demonstrate, but getting back on this uh, uh, region here. So why was there no response when we elevated the PEEP? Here you already see low dorsal ventilation, only 4%. But if you then apply a different color scaling, you basically see clearly the effect uh, that is uh, shown here. This is an area, and that is displayed in the ERT images in purple color, that is representing pleural fusion. So the explanation why a PEEP increasement increase did not result in a recruitment here, that was due to the fact that fluid is located here in the pleura. And then, of course, the lung cannot be opened. How can I uh, claim the, the dorsal purple parts are caused by pleural fusion? Well, that is based on a study that was published uh, three years ago. And uh, this is actually a group where I have a close cooperation with. It's uh, just located uh, 80 kilom kilometers uh, from where I live. And this study group has actually uh, assessed, systematically assessed this. So they have uh, uh, validated based on ultrasound that uh, one group of the patients, the study group had pleural fusion, then they did the drainage. And you can already clearly see here that uh, just by the drainage, you, you will lose those purple spots. And that basically they have uh, done here the group uh, with its purple spots, a uh, very high amount of purple spots before drainage, uh, much less after drainage, but still more as compared to the control group. That was also confirmed by ultrasound that the control group did not have any pleural fusion. So basically they could say that the presence of those purple spots is uh, based on ERT, uh, results in high sensitivity and specificity. So it's another thing that, uh, especially when you change the color scale in uh, the, our device, the Pomo Vista, uh, that uh, you can nicely identify the presence of pleural fusion. And then of course, uh, right now I only showed you two examples of patients where we didn't have the positive response where nothing could be recruited. This is an example, um, I should also display you uh, the regional ventilation of distribution. So you can already see that in such a ventilation pattern, that all the ventilation or almost 80% of the ventilation takes place in the upper lung. And then you see that only very little, again, very little ventilation takes place in the lower lung. So that is typically already, just by this uh, interpreting those numbers, you already know that this patient would probably benefit from a higher PEEP in order to get a better balance between the ventral and the dorsal part. And so again, in this patient, it was just a PEEP elevation of five. And what you can see already at this minor PEEP elevation is that you have a substantial win in dorsal compliance. And of course, the win would probably also be much, much higher if you would have increased the PEEP higher or if you would have done a recruitment maneuver in this patient. So I hope at least that based on those three examples, I could already demonstrate the three typical patterns that we see in our patients and that uh, this image guided approach uh, basically explains very well uh, the prediction which of those patients could benefit from a recruitment maneuver in the subsequent PEEP trial. Okay. Then talking about PEEP titration, another three examples. It's, it's not the same patient, so I uh, took different examples to give you just a broader uh, insight in the different behavior. Um, again, just what I explained, just, just to recap, um, what we typically do is, 
in the main view or in the trend views, we can arrange the regions of interest into four different layers. And we basically focused on this tidal variation in the dorsal part. And basically, when we see uh, signs of collapse or asymmetrical, uneven dorsal shapes, or we say see no ventilation at all in the dorsal part, this is always uh, the point where we would look uh, closer and uh, define this uh, patterns as candidates where uh, patients could benefit from a recruitment maneuver. Then. I would uh, always recommend to use the button enhanced colors in order to check the purple spots that I demonstrated you, because these would indicate pleural fusion, and these would also indicate that the patient probably wouldn't benefit uh, from a recruitment maneuver. But if this uh, rough initial analysis would uh, suspect or result in the suspicion of lung collapse, then the elevate the, the PEEP could moderately be elevated, and there's not still not really a clearly defined uh, PEEP increase, but it could be just an elevation of five centimeters of water, maybe for 30 seconds should be sufficient. And just with this little simplified approach, you could already make a nice prediction who of the patients will benefit from a recruitment maneuver. Okay. And then we would uh, use the diagnostic view in order to set three different uh, sections. The one at the baseline, at the state where you made your initial assessment uh, based on the regions of interest, then during the PEEP elevation and after the PEEP elevation. It's very important to set uh, the original PEEP after this PEEP elevation. And then you would see uh, these three patterns that I have already demonstrated. So only for those patients where you would do the recruitment maneuver and then the subsequent PEEP trial, I would like to introduce you uh, our PEEP trial analysis. And the nice thing about this PEEP trial analysis is that in this uh, analysis view, uh, all the sections with the different PEEP steps are already automatically identified. So it's completely user independent. You just open up the view and you get already the analysis points that so-called sections displayed here. And then basically you can do an assessment for each of the identified PEEP steps. And it can be more than five. It could be up to 15 different PEEP steps, I also should say and mention. Well, in this patient, if you compare those tidal images, you see that they're looking more or less exactly the same. Uh, and, uh, however, they're getting a little bit brighter, and that already means that uh, it was uh, this was done during pressure controlled ventilation. So if the image is getting brighter, you're having a higher compliance at the lower PEEP levels. And the explanation is, well, no matter which PEEP level you are looking at, the dorsal lung remained fully open uh, even at the lowest PEEP level. Yeah. We see a minor, minor decrease here of ventilation, but that is then can be neglected. So in such a patient, we can say, uh, even at the lowest PEEP level six, the lung was fully open. So uh, we should never put the PEEP higher than six in such a patient, because uh, there's no potential for lung recruitment. You also see that the crossing point here is uh, very low. So um, it also means that, uh, yeah, the PEEP level should be set as a low level. Second example, you already can see by this asymmetric shape that um, obviously the lung was not uh, fully recruited. And then, uh, of course, here the interpretation is already a little bit more tricky. What you see is that uh, in the at the lowest PEEP level, you not only have lost the dorsal ventilation of the left lung, but you also lost the right lung. And so that means uh, in this patient, uh, the PEEP should be set a little bit higher, or much higher even, yeah? at least at the PEEP level of 10 or 12 to keep the right lung open. And then it's, of course, uh, based on the doctor's decision, but also it's based on uh, different findings, for example, from uh, lung ultrasound or CT scan, whether or not there's a prediction that uh, 
taking maybe a considering a more aggressive recruitment maneuver could possibly also open up the doors a lot. But as you can imagine, it's very hard to, to rely simply and solely on the ERT images. But typically, uh, you know, when you are at the bedside, uh, there's much more of, uh, information available. So in this patient, it's not quite clear whether or not the doctor would have decided to do a, a little bit more aggressive recruitment maneuver with higher peak inspiratory pressures. And the last example, and that is the uh, classic example that I uh, really like to demonstrate. In this patient, again, a very moderate recruitment maneuver, but again, it was not an ARDS patient. It was a patient just after cardiac surgery, and the dorsal collapse of, of the lung was induced by the anesthesia and not the lung disease. So uh, very, very easy to open up those patients. And here you nicely see that at the peep level of uh, 14, the lung was fully opened. It didn't change at all at the peep level of 12. At the peep level of 10, it's almost open, but you see that lung collapse already starts. And remember the first slide of the CT scan where I showed you this yellow transition zone between ventilated and collapsed lung region. You see here the patterns uh, that would suggest uh, cycling opening and closing. So in this patient, even though the PEEP of 10 would probably almost have a completely opened lung, I would rather recommend to either change the respiratory rate or to go for the next higher PEEP level. Just to illustrate it, I'm not going to any details here. This is a typical pattern that you would see for cycling, cycling open and closing. It's located typically in the transition zone between lung collapse and ventilated lung regions. And uh, typically you see a delayed opening of those uh, lung regions. And we are here seeing the pixel waveforms, but it's all affecting here those uh, yellow marked regions. So you see a delayed filling because first the opening pressure in this lung region has to be reached during the inspiration, but you also see a early closing of this lung region. So that is a classical pattern of a lung region that is uh, at risk uh, of cycling, opening and closing. Then of course, uh, you may ask yourself, uh, well, now uh, we have this image guided uh, approach, we can uh, identify these kind of uh, lung regions that are collapsed or over the standard or maybe uh, are opening uh, cyclically, but does it really have an effect on outcome? And uh, I must say, uh, this is of course a time where uh, very many centers are planning outcome studies. And uh, so it all started with ma major, uh, mainly observational PEEP studies, and we have already plenty of those. So all in all, I, I believe we have uh, more than 20 studies uh, at very different uh, uh, approaches for PEEP titration. They have looked at different parameters. They have used it on different uh, patient populations. So ARDS patient, COVID patient, uh, laparoscopic abdominal surgery. So there's a large uh, variety of uh, different patient populations. And, uh, but those uh, initial studies over the last uh, few years, they have not been really randomly, randomized controlled studies. And that is exactly what is starting now. So we already got received the first study here from Taiwan. And they uh, demonstrated that uh, using the same approach uh, of peak titration that I demonstrated you, and they've compared it here to the uh, low inflation maneuver, of uh, the PEEP titration based on the on the ventilator. But here they, uh, in the study group, they also used the estimation of uh, the lung collapse and over the stanchion. So basically exactly the same approach that I presented uh, before. And in this uh, study, they found that uh, at least the driving pressures were significantly decreased. And they also saw a small signal in survival rate. They, they could not really find uh, statistically significant differences, but there was a 
small signal in favor of the ERT study group uh, in terms of mortality. And now we just got a publication on the next uh, study, and that is a study from China. And in this study, they've again taken the same approach with the peak titration. And uh, they, they also found a minor signal in the hospital survival rate in favor of the ERT study group. Uh, however, the study was underpowered, so even though they could demonstrate a decrease of uh, 6% in mortality in the ERT group, it was uh, st statistically non-significant because of the uh, low number of uh, patients that have been used. So, currently uh, we are in a state uh, where we can uh, present very many smaller studies that all show promising signals, but it's not really uh, that's uh, evidence that we are still waiting for uh, or the entire ERT community, of course, not just Draga. <laughs> we are all waiting for this uh, larger randomized controlled trials, uh, which uh, finally, hopefully, can demonstrate uh, that if you take these same approaches, like in this first initial studies, that you can that be able to demonstrate outcome improvements in terms of mortality or hospital stay. Okay, so the conclusions for this uh, presentation. Uh, I think with the image guided lung protection, uh, which, which is based on regional information on the lung and on the tidal volumes, it's very useful for uh, predicting lung recruitability, assessing recruitment maneuvers itself and also the subsequent peep trials and uh, what we certainly can nicely visualize not only during procedures but what we always uh, can display is uh, the alveolar collapse and over distension when we just look on this uh, regional approach with the regions of interest so especially when we look on the ventral and the dorsal part and the amount of ventilation and we can also identify regions with a cycling opening and closing. However, uh, we, have, uh, we have some evidence right now. We have some clinical outcome studies. However, the statistical significance has to be demonstrated in the next larger trials, multi-center trials. All right, that was uh, my first presentation for now. So I believe now it's time for questions. Thank you very much for now. Thank you very much, Echo, for this excellent overview. I think it was very detailed and I think there was enough clinical evidence to support the benefits of Pulma Vista when it comes to the um, evaluation of the response to the recruitment maneuver. So thank you for that. Um, yep. Now we will have some time for the questions and answers. So if you do have any questions please type them in into your question box uh, the question box is located on the right hand side on your go to webinar uh, platform tool and uh, we have already received the first question um, any information on eit and the use of psi do is there any evidence available for that in the uh, when when we set the psi function in the ventilator, right? Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a there's a study there's a study from uh, the ERT study group from Milano. It's uh, Tommaso Mauri, and he has actually demonstrated that. Uh, what, what I didn't mention so far is that uh, besides of uh, looking on ventilation distribution, we can also quantify changes of uh, end expiratory lung volume. And what they could uh, demonstrate is that uh, with a psi function, without doing recruitment maneuvers, it's because it's like a small recruitment approach, we will win over time and expert to lung volume, which uh, is a good way. And of course, then it would be, I have not access to the data, but of course it would be beneficial if uh, it could be demonstrated that the main win appears in the dorsal regions that have been maybe collapsed. So it could be that with a psi function, we we have a nice uh, uh, 
a nice tool of uh, recruiting the lung without doing recruitment maneuvers. And that has been assessed with uh, EIT. Excellent. Thank you so much, Echo. Um, also, um, I think I would like to follow up with a question. Uh, when it comes to the, um, the um, regional ventilation delay, um, how we can interpret this data, especially in relation to the recruitability of the lung um, and potential contributor to the lung collapse? Shall we use this uh, in like more quantifiable form or is it just an indication? How is it currently used in the clinical practice? I, I should also mention that, uh, of course, because it's such a new parameter, uh, there's not there's not so much experience on that. Uh, so, but but I have already drafted a, a guide how to how to analyze uh, the regional ventilation delay. And uh, as I say, it's it's rather uh, it's not so much uh, the quantification of those uh, parameters because they basically can change from peep level to peep level very easily. And uh, they can go up and down depending on how large the transition zone between the collapsed and the open lung is. So I would uh, currently, at least at this time, not recommend to only rely on the numbers of those parameters, but rather to make an interpretation of the patterns. So whenever you see um, uh, the presence of lung collapse, basically no ventilation taking place in the dorsal region, and then you have this automatically this transition zone, then uh, you already, and then uh, if you take a look on the local waveforms and see, oh, there's a presence of late opening, early closing, all these kind of uh, indicators are suggesting uh, cycling opening and closing. And then of course, uh, in order to, uh, to avoid this kind of condition, uh, probably the users, the clinical users would then increase the PEEP settings uh, by steps of two until they uh, see the absence of uh, cycling opening and closing. However, okay. we also see in the regional ventilation delay that uh, if this takes place in larger regions in the ventral part, this can also be an indicator of uh, emphysema, for example, where we typically see uh, regions with extremely long time constants. And mm -hmm. uh, also in spontaneously breathing with uh, patients with a high respiratory drive, we also can identify patterns of uh, pendel luft. And that is another very interesting part. The time today didn't allow to also prevent these kind of uh, patterns, but it's it's more at this point, I would say to, to make it as a conclusion, it's more uh, the, the use is more the recognition of different patterns suggesting different lung pathologies because in the healthy lung we typically do not see uh, the effects of regional ventilation delay so much. Okay, excellent. Thank you so much, um, Echo providing your insight in this. So welcome back. Um, yeah, in the second part of this uh, webinar, <coughs> excuse me, I'd like to demonstrate you with very similar ERT data that I just had in the PowerPoint, how easy the use of those uh, images and the inter interpretation is uh, also at the bedside based on the original software that we have uh, uh, available uh, as a PC version. And, but that is exactly identical to the Homovista software version. Except uh, now, of course, I'm using simulated data, so that's real patient data that have been uh, taken from some clinical trials. So the first example that I would like to demonstrate you again is uh, when we uh, have a trend display of the maneuver that I would like to present you. First, I would uh, rather uh, go into the views mode, uh, taking a look on the main view or the end inspiratory trend view, because those two views will give you this uh, in information about the regional ventilation uh, in the dorsal layer. So, and if you would see that uh, in your assessment here in such a trial, right at the baseline, let's say, that uh, you're getting here these kind of images such a distribution of tidal volumes. 
then you can immediately see with some uh, you know learning that um, there's nothing absolutely nothing wrong with this ventilation distribution so basically you see that the dorsal ventilation in this example is at nine uh, percent uh, you also see that the uh, ventilation between the upper half of the lung and the lower half of the lung is well balanced you can see it already here in the image but if you also take a look here on the regions number three and four that gives us uh, 54 percent or 55 percent um, then uh, this is uh, absolutely sufficient so there's basically nothing that should be changed but that was not part of this uh, study here so in this uh, study, they actually have changed it. They have increased the PEEP by 10, by 10 centimeters of water. You still, of course, see a redistribution of ventilation when you take a look on those uh, uh, differential images here, where blue means uh, more tidal volume and orange means less. So of course, the higher the PEEP is, the more the ventilation will be uh, pressed into the dorsal part of the lung. However, in this example it doesn't really as a benefit but if you would now assess it with a diagnostics view and there we have a new function here that is called uh, test recruitability um, so first of all you also here you have to define sections now so you have to add two or three sections and in the best case if you have done this uh, kind of peep elevation you would uh, compare the status at the baseline, so before the PEEP elevation has been done, during the PEEP elevation, and after the PEEP elevation. And that is something when you press a button, analyze recruitability, then you would immediately see the results uh, as a series of images. Okay, and then basically what can be seen as I said before, there's no presence of lung collapse in those images. And then you see only a decrease of compliance during the higher PEEP due to over distension. And that is uh, absolutely clear. It, it, uh, there's no dorsal uh, lung region that can be recruited. And if there's nothing to be recruited, of course, compliance can only drop. There can be no run lung region that is opened uh, where compliance would increase. So basically, we only see the uh, orange part here during the PEEP elevation. And that is something that you could also see when you just elevate the PEEP by four or five centimeters of water. We see some uh, sustaining increase of end expiratory lung volume. So basically, you could say that uh, this uh, small duration of PEEP increase can be taken as a, a kind of extended sigh, but uh, so so higher inspiratory pressures, uh, higher uh, PEEP, but uh, it doesn't really uh, is something the patient would benefit from. Again, this is in, with this little maneuver, you could clearly identify and predict this patient would not benefit from any kind of uh, recruitment maneuver, Maybe a PEEP titration starting here to go even further down with the PEEP levels, uh, that is something that could, could be considered. But certainly no PEEP elevation because it doesn't bring any benefit in this particular example. So as a next example, I would uh, like to show you something a little bit more complex. Okay, and here I have to open a series of files. So it takes a little while, so we need to wait a little bit in order to load the entire data set. I'm sorry about that. And that is a, a file from a patient where prior fusion was determined. So remember those purple spots that I demonstrated to you. I will do it at the very end because I first want to load the data. So I have already the display and the trend data, so we don't have to wait any longer. Okay, so first again, I go into the end inspiratory trend view so that we already can immediately take a look uh, on the distribution of 
tidal volumes before we actually make our assessment. And then you can see that uh, at the baseline, but that doesn't change, this pattern doesn't change even at the higher peak levels. Uh, we basically see a, a very uneven distribution of the dorsal lung. So the, the contour that, that has, doesn't have the normal shape that you would expect. It has a normal shape in the ventral part, in the ventral half, but here in those uh, regions here, it looks uh, uh, as the lung was certainly not be fully ventilated. So that is definitely something where we could do an assessment. Um, but um, I can predict you already that uh, this was also a non-responder because I can slightly see here already a purple spot and that suggests that this patient had flora effusion. I don't know about this part here, but that is something that I can demonstrate you right after the trend analysis, uh, how that is displayed in the normal view, in the monitoring view. So now I'm waiting for the assessment. So again, we are first setting here three sections, like I demonstrated it before. We put one after, one during the PEEP elevation. And you can also see that the PEEP elevation here was only four centimeters of water. We do again the assessment of lung recruitability. Okay. And here we see basically that uh, again, in this patient, when we increase the PEEP only slightly, we lose already in the ventral part 15% uh, of the compliance. So a significant drop in compliance. We, we might see a t little tiny win in the transition zone between the pleura fusion and the ventilated part. And that is because uh, due to the higher pressure, uh, maybe the, the pleura gap is uh, modified a little bit in its shape but it's not really true recruitment. It's just a displacement of the lung towards a region that's filled with uh, pleura fluid. And so basically what we see is we have no win. So in this part, we, we even though we have only elevated the peak by four, we could say it's uh, not enough. But in this example, I can demonstrate you uh, why we do not see any benefits in this particular patient. So it's another example for the uh, for a non-recruiter. However, in contrast to the first one where the lung was fully opened, here the lung is not fully opened. And I will show you why this patient was a non-recruiter. Because uh, we, we have uh, integrated now in our main view and we will also add this to the other views in the next software version because there's so much valuable information behind it. We now have the means to enhance the contrast of the color scales so that we can uh, better identify those regions of the lung that might be filled with fluid. And if you now keep this button pressed, you basically can see the one region that is filled with fluid. Just a second. Okay, now I keep it pressed. You can see in the dorsal right lung a large purple uh, region. So that is pleura fusion, but also on the right or uh, the left lung, the left dorsal lung, you also see those purple spots. So they're also indicating and suggesting pleura fusion. Uh, what you also see in the ventral part, that is actually the fluid uh, that is contained in the metastinum. So we see the same effects that are caused by pleura fusion can only also be seen in the in the mediastinal part, uh, either though through uh, aortic movement or the heart itself. Yeah. So, but basically, what we utilize here in this view is the uh, interpretation of some reconstructions artifacts that are uh, uh, caused by physiological conditions. Right now, we are not making any claims. We also do not do a quantification of those purple regions. That is something for the future. But at least we can clearly demonstrate uh, the effect of fluid on the lung. So there's no ventilation because uh, there is a pleura effusion present at this part. And we have a study demonstrating those. 
And then, of course, uh, if there's pleural fusion, uh, uh, recruitment maneuver should only be considered after the draining of this uh, uh, fluid. Okay, so another example of a non-recruiter, and that was done just with this tiny little test. Now I show you the third file I'd like to demonstrate, and that is in responder now. Again, we have to wait for a few seconds before I'm able, able to demonstrate you. But that was also a uh, post cardiac surgery patient uh, where the dorsal ventilation was low. But this patient, I won't uh, go and not change the color scales, but uh, I can tell you that in this patient, there was no presence of those uh, purple dorsal spots. So certainly a patient without uh, pleural fusion. First of all, again, I go into the end inspiratory trend view. So this is how this patient looks like. And then let's start again at the baseline. So that was a recording during the steady state. It looks a little bit like a tooth from the shape. Basically what you see is that, uh, and that is an uh, example I also presented already in the PowerPoint in the hour before. So basically what you see is that more than 80% or about 80% of the ventilation takes place in the upper half of the lung. So if, if you see this, this uh, distribution of ventilation, then you already immediately can uh, conclude that this patient should at least uh, get a higher PEEP. We are not sure about the recruitment maneuver, but certainly if you see such a ventilation distribution in the absence of pleural fusion, then you can already uh, immediately uh, consider elevating the PEEP a bit to get a better balance between the higher and the lower lung. And when we do that, and that is just done here again by the peep elevation of five, you already see that uh, now at least uh, from 18, no, from 22% in the dorsal lung, now we at least gained 28%. So the dorsal lung is already much better ventilated as compared to the baseline. But now when we want to assess lung recruitability again, do this rather systematic approach, taking more than two analysis points, what we can demonstrate here is we first add three sections again. We set one section behind, one section at the baseline, one section during the PEEP elevation. Then we do the recruitability test again. So, and what we now see is basically uh, the elevation of the end expiratory lung impedance, the, the increase of end expiratory lung volume. That, of course, is only caused here by the PEEP elevation. So, we, because we are increasing the force that keeps more air inside the lung. So, during this PEEP elevation, this information is uh, not really uh, particularly useful. But we should basically look, do we have a substantial win of end expiratory lung volume? And in this particular case, we do not see a win, especially not in the dorsal part. But that was also probably because the PEEP was only increased by five centimeters of water. But the main signal again that we see is uh, when we increase the PEEP slightly, we immediately see a large increase of uh, uh, regional lung compliance. We see a minor orange spot here in the right lung, in the light right ventral lung, and that might already be an indication of moderate uh, hyperinflation. But uh, I mean, there's still plenty of, of volume here, so the, the uh, compliance is not bad, but it's slightly minor as compared to the baseline. But we definitely see this large win of uh, compliance in the dorsal part and in the central part. 
So in this patient, this patient definitely deserves a, a recruitment maneuver and a subsequent decremental PEEP trial. So again, these are the three examples, the three patterns that we are typically seeing. The patient where the lung is fully recruited and there's no need at all to change something on the therapy to do any kind of recruitment maneuvers. This such a patient would also not require a proning maneuver. You know, uh, if the lung is fully recruited, the dorsal lung shows nice knee ventilation. There's also no need to do a proning of this patient, at least not for uh, optimizing the distribution of ventilation. Then the second pattern was a patient which had pleural fusion and there's no chance to do the recruitment before the uh, fluid was drained. And in this example, this is a nice example of a somebody of a patient who would posit positively respond to a recruitment maneuver. Then uh, the second thing I'd like to demonstrate is the PEEP trial, the assessment of PEEP trials itself. So you could, of course, also do uh, PEEP titration maneuvers without a recruitment maneuver beforehand. And this is something that I would also like to demonstrate you now. And that is just one single file that loads up much more quickly. So the first, one, first thing I'd like to mention is whenever you load our open trend data on your device, which contain a PEEP trial, it's already automatically identified because we, are, we have an algorithm that monitors the stepwise decrease of end expiratory lung impedance. And if such a step, at least three steps are determined and identified, then those sections are automatically assigned. And then all you need to do is pressing the peep try button. And that's no matter who does it, you always get the same results. And what I explained before is you don't see any change in the regional ventilation of uh, distribution of uh, ventilation. The only thing you see is that the image are getting slightly brighter towards lower peep levels, indicating a higher compliance. But then you see that uh, also the signs of overdistension, the signs of collapse are really minor, very minor. So in such a patient, and the explanation is easy, that was a patient that where the lung was fully opened at the lowest peep, so no potential to recruit the lung again. That's all I wanted to show you. Also remarkably, there's no large presence of uh, regional ventilation delay. So no matter where you look in your lung region, you will see that any kind of pixel is following uh, more or less the average curse. And that is a typical pattern that you would also see in mostly uh, spontaneously breathing volunteers of problems with healthy lung, except they have a very strong respiratory force then typically uh, the, the air in those uh, subjects would uh, go quicker into the dorsal part of the lung due to the diaphragmatic uh, movement. Yeah, but in th those patients, uh, you, you can already be very sure that uh, this patient doesn't have uh, any issues with time constants or cycling opening and closing. Okay, then the next uh, example, that I'd like to display. Again, a little bit more complex. Sorry, it's uh, it's it's taking a little bit of time uh, to open up those files, but it's a. Uh, recording of a video longer than uh, 10 minutes and that takes some time and so i have to apologize that you need to wait a few seconds now it's loaded 
Okay, first of all, you see that uh, in this example, you see only three PEEP steps because the time scale was selected in a way where not the full recruitment maneuver or PEEP trial was included. So you have to manually adjust the time scale of your trend data. And now you again see that the uh, five uh, sections have been identified. Again, that was uh, data from the same study, same patient population, post-cardiac surgery patients. And you again see uh, that uh, first recruitment maneuver was done, then the PEEP trial in steps of uh, two centimeters of water. And in total, we had five different PEEP sections. And now we want to assess again the PEEP trial again itself not the recruitment maneuver. And that was uh, the patient where, where you definitely see that, uh, yeah, this patient probably would require a recruitment maneuver, maybe a more aggressive one, because what we see in this analysis is that uh, when you go down with a PEEP down to six, you see already a substantial decrease of dorsal lung compliance and basically that is affecting uh, the entire left lung already. So the left lung really uh, displays the decrease of lung compliance and that is actually something I've seen very often in post-cardiac surgery patients because uh, during the surgical procedure, depending on the procedure that was uh, performed, uh, we often see the compromised uh, lung function of the left lung. That is uh, very typical. So uh, this patient definitely needs a, a higher PEEP. And uh, we have to state that at least uh, with this kind of recruitment maneuver, uh, the doctors were not capable of opening up the left lung. Possibly a higher more aggressive recruitment maneuvers with higher end inspiratory pressures would have opened also the left lung. Okay. But the crossing point, that is something that you can see here as compared to the first uh, section, uh, first example, uh, where the lung was fully opened already at the baseline. Here you see that the crossing point is actually much, much more to the left, so towards higher PEEP levels. And that is also something I should mention that uh, the thicker the lung is, the more the crossing point is located towards higher PEEP levels. Because the price you have to pay to keep the lung open is getting higher and higher the thicker the lung is. Okay. Okay, now uh, coming to my last example. Of course, I would like to demonstrate you a recruiter or a responder to a PEEP titration. And again, that was uh, another patient from this study. Just one single file again, so it doesn't take very long to open it up. And I'm not showing you any kind of nice examples. I mean, all the uh, data, and that was a study including more than 40 patients, all the data of the study and every of those patients, uh, those PEEP stats were identified. And we really see, even though that is a very homogeneous patient population, all post-cardiac sur surgery patients, we always see those very different patterns. And uh, it's kind of a surprise in every single patient we are observing. Uh, we always see new uh, pieces of information with clear, uh, but this clustering that I mentioned in fully open, recruitable or partly recruitable that always repeats again and again. So in this patient, we do the PEEP trial analysis again. And here we see again what I was already demonstrating you uh, based on the PowerPoint, but here it's a little bit more interactive. So first of all, we have five different analysis points. For each of those analysis points, we're getting those tidal images representing the regional distribution of tidal volumes. We see the presence of yellow spots 
and that is something that we don't see at the higher peep levels but they're starting here at the peep level of 10 in this example and we see that the higher you go with the peep levels the more decrease of ventral compliance you see but that is exactly the price again you have to pay to keep the doors along open and i would also not say that this uh, you know doors along this ventral decrease of lung compliance is particularly harmful because still we see lots of ventilation taking place in the ventral part of the lung. So it doesn't mean that those over distension is completely uh, 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 abolishing the ventral part of ventilation. That is not true. So we still see uh, ventral ventilation in the, those affected regions. At the opposite, we see towards lower peep levels, the uh, building up of uh, dorsal lung collapse, and that is actually getting quite high at the lowest peep level that was set. And then suggesting here the crossing mark, somebody would probably set the peep to 10. However, if you see those yellow spots, you could do an analysis of those. And if you see, oh, there's a very late opening that disappears at the next higher peep level you could either decide for the next higher peep level of 12 where when you take a look on those images you see still see a very slight delay but it's no matter where you go here it, it looks much more homogeneous as compared to the peep level of eight or you could probably also try to increase the respiratory rate so that the time doesn't have uh, so much time to fall into this uh, pattern of cycling, opening and closing. Yes, that was again kind of a repeating of the same information that I initially presented you on the PowerPoint, but now it was uh, rather in a hands-on style and I believe it was a little bit more interactive, giving you a better impression how this kind of analysis and assessment of the recruitability can be done uh, in an image-guided way, directly at the bedside. So thank you very much. And uh, if you should have uh, any more questions, uh, now it's I, I believe we have a little bit more time to address those questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Echo, for this excellent demonstration. I think um, you had really a great number of examples um, of different types of patients, because I think in a lot of cases, our customers um, have asked, even in the first webinar, what kind of patients would benefit, what kind of therapy interventions um, we can apply Pulmovist, and I usually respond to them, well, basically in any kind of patient that, that don't have open um, wounds um, in, around the chest area, so basically for the chest, uh, for the belt positioning. Uh, but there, there is really a diverse set of patients that we can connect and we can get the clinical data from. So thank you for this. I think it was um, quite extensive and um, quite detailed. Um, so um, if you have any questions, uh, please do not hesitate to ask your questions in the question box. Um, so, so far, we have not received any questions and um, in case if you do get questions later you could of course reach out to Draeger Mia yeah. Academy and we would be happy to provide more details and again we will have our third webinar of the series on August 6th and we are going to talk about the transpulmonary pressure measurement and the advantages that we get uh, from the combination of measuring of the volumes from the ventilator and the pressures from the pulmovista. So, Eckert, thank you so much uh, for your time today and for sharing with us your knowledge and expertise. I think it was an excellent webinar and the webinar is recorded and will be available for downloads uh, for, uh, for later on. And again, in case if you have any questions, please do not hesitate to contact us. And I would like to thank you all for your attention. And uh, we'll meet us again um, on August 6th. All right. Bye-bye. And thanks also from my side for listening.
I hope you found that interesting and uh, hope to see you in August soon. Again, bye-bye. Thank you.